Hello and welcome here at EAO's Just Ask, your monthly live appointment with a leading expert in implant dentistry. My name is Gerrit Heikop, I'm the host of this EAO channel, and tonight we're going to answer all your questions about soft tissue management. And to do that tonight, I'm joined by David Nissan from Paris. David, good evening. Good evening, Gerrit. Good Hi. evening to everybody. Yes, good to have you with us. You're a periodontist for uh, many years. You have a private practice and uh, spend a lot of time in there with your clients. You've been with EEO for over 10 years, and you also happen to be the president of the French Society of Periodontology and Implantology. So you seem to be the right expert to be uh, having with us here tonight, talking about soft tissue management. Um, we are live, it's interactive, and that means you can participate via our live chat. And I see quite some people are doing that already. If you haven't done so, please make, take uh, the opportunity to uh, make a little shout out and let us know who you are and where you're watching from, just like Philippe and Adam and Quico and Alice and Victor is doing. Victor, good to see you back. I remember you from uh, last month's Just Ask. And also Sebastian is joining us from Chile. So I think uh, we should say uh, good early afternoon uh, to you, Sebastian. Manuel is with us from Austria. So keep doing that a little bit. And if anywhere during this session you hear something that raises a question to David or to me or to anyone in the room, just uh, use the live chat and, um, and be interactive with us and make the most of this uh, virtual appointment. Now, David, we're talking about soft tissue management uh, tonight, and I guess we should start with the beginning. Why is it important to devote a EO just asked to this topic? Why is it important to consider soft tissue management when we look at implant dentistry? Yeah, I think soft tissue management is a very, very nice uh, topic. It's an important uh, topic because uh, today we want to place an uh, implant, but of course we want to, to, to get uh, an aesthetic outcome. And uh, we have a, a lot of scientific evidence to, to clearly show today that it's not uh, sufficient anymore to have a bone around an implant. If you want to have an aesthetic outcome, you need to have the bone, but also the, the soft tissue. So I think that uh, it's, a, it's a very nice uh, topic because sometimes maybe there is uh, uh, some confusion regarding the timing of the implant placement and the, the timing of the, of the management of the soft tissue. Exactly. And th th those are things we're all going to try to clear out tonight. Uh, first thing you mentioned is aesthetic considerations. Does that mean that when we talk about soft tissue management, we're also, also always talking about implants in the aesthetic zone? Yeah, I think that at least for tonight, uh, we will focus on, on the aesthetic zone. But of course, I mean, when you place the uh, implant in the, the posterior area, when the, the aesthetic impact is uh, less important, of course, you have to take care of the soft tissue. So soft, soft tissue is very important for the yeah. aesthetic outcome, but it, it's also very important to avoid any uh, biological complication down the road. Exactly, perfect. Well, in the meantime, the, uh, the live chat is going nuts and this is very exciting. I always love it when we are able to connect curious dentists from around the world. We have Brenda from uh, Montpellier with us. We have Manuel from Austria. We have uh, Jimen from Algeria. I see uh, Pascal saying hi, David. Henrik is with us. Bernard from Paris. We have Nozim from Uzbekistan. Hey, of all places, so a uh, very late evening over mm -hmm. there, I think, covering all time zones. Mario from Italy and Tung from Turkey. So we have a, a very diverse crowd with us. Now, you also prepared some slides for us, David, with yes, uh, a short introduction. Why don't you uh, take us into the topic of soft tissue management? So I'll share my screen with you. Um, so here we go. Up. So with the, the, the soft tissue management in the aesthetic zone. So as we just uh, uh, said, with uh, Garrett tonight, uh, with the available time, we will dedicate to the topic. I think it's, it's, it's better to, to focus on the management of the aesthetic zone. And um, I think that today we have uh, a lot of scientific uh, uh, data to clearly show that when we have to place implant in the aesthetic zone, in most of the clinical situation, uh, according to Yuri Grunder in 2016, uh, in almost 90% of the case, the bone volume is not sufficient. So when you have to place implant in the aesthetic zone, in most of the situation, you have to build the bone either before the implant uh, placement or at the time of implant placement. Is it 
sufficient? Well, not always, because uh, even if the uh, guided bone regeneration or the bone regeneration is, is uh, perfect, you may have some uh, bone remodeling down the road. And if you get some bone remodeling, it may lead to soft tissue rotation and an inadequate aesthetic uh, outcome. Of course, we know today that there is some risk factor for the bone remodeling, such as the surgical technique. And there is clear evidence today uh, that immediate implant placement might be uh, might lead to uh, aesthetic uh, failure because of uh, bone remodeling and uh, uh, soft tissue shrinkage. Also, when you decide to place an implant in the aesthetic zone, in a case where there is a thin biotype, then the risk of bone remodeling is, uh, is more important. So building the bone is uh, uh, necessary, but in most of the situation, it might not be uh, sufficient. I'd like to share with you one very nice uh, publication. Uh, this is a publication from the group of, uh, of Gründer. I really like this publication. I'm not sure there is a lot of publication uh, on this uh, topic. And I like this publication. It's not a lot of patients. It's only 16 uh, patients. Um, it's important because, uh, as you can see, there is, uh, I mean, the timing of the implant placement is uh, an early implant placement. So they extract uh, the tooth, a traumatic tooth extraction. They place the implant six to eight weeks uh, with a, a guided bone regeneration. It's uh, the group of uh, Gründer, so as you can see, they use a non-resorbable titanium-reinforced membrane. Uh, then they wait for the implant osseointegration. They do a connective tissue graft at the time of the removal of uh, the membrane, uh, and then the uh, prosthetic uh, uh, restoration. It's a nice publication because, as you may see uh, on the screen, they took impression. They took impression before the surgery. Uh, they took impression six months after implant placement with a guided bone regeneration. They took impression one month after the soft tissue uh, grafting, right after crown uh, placement, but also after one year. So it's, a, it's a not a lot of patient, but it's a nice publication. And as you may uh, understand, there is several um, uh, impression. They will superimpose the cast model, and then they can evaluate what the, uh, the bone regeneration will give and what the soft tissue uh, uh, conditioning will uh, give. And as you can see, uh, here is the outcome. Let's uh, make it uh, quite short. It's, sorry, it's important because as you can see, almost 50% of the final volume you will get is related to the soft tissue. So even if you do an implant uh, with simultaneous guided bone regeneration using a titanium reinforced membrane, 50% of the final volume in the buccal area will be uh, associated with the soft tissue conditioning. So I think it's a very nice uh, publication to clearly uh, show and to clearly understand the impact and the importance of uh, the soft tissue grafting even if you do uh, uh, a bone uh, grafting. And uh, as an illustration, I'd like to share with you this case. Uh, this is an implant, as you can see with the design of the implant, this implant was placed uh, some 15 years ago uh, by my former uh, partner. And uh, you know it's all styled implant, but uh, still look at the uh, bone level. It's uh, pretty impressive. So it's a, it's a very nice, uh, outcome in terms of, uh, of bone. And this case was perfect from an aesthetic point of view for, for years. And after 10 or 12 years, uh, there is uh, some bone remodeling. And this bone remodeling was uh, associated with soft tissue shrinkage. And then the patient came back to the practice uh, and she was like uh, a big concern uh, with two points. First of all, the uh, soft tissue rotation but also the shadow. As you may see on the screen, there is a shadow. And uh, so for us, it was a success for 10 years, but then it's here, it's a long-term aesthetic complication. Uh, one last important uh, information, this case uh, was 
treated with an early implant protocol with simultaneous guided bone regeneration. So we may uh, think that uh, down the road, some bone remodeling occur on the buccal aspect, and this bone remodeling on the buccal aspect was associated with this uh, soft tissue rotation. Exactly, and and uh, thank you for that short introduction. If you if you just joined us, uh, welcome at EAO Just Live. We have a broad group of people uh, joining us from all over the world. Ian is just joining us from Australia as well. And I invite you all if you have any issues, questions, or topics that you would like to discuss regarding soft tissue management, make most of your time with us and and type in your questions in the chat so I can relay them uh, to David. Now. David, so you gave us two important uh, risk factors and, and, and ideas to consider or to even pay more attention to uh, um, uh, uh, soft tissue management. It's the thin biotype and um, the immediate placement. And you've shown us that uh, almost 50% of the volume is coming from the soft tissue. So why, and, and I've asked you this before, but I, I keep wondering about this, why do we still need to discuss this tonight? Why is this not a, a no-brainer and is everybody just doing this? I think that it's it's a tricky topic because today there is different trend in the uh, in aesthetic uh, implant and uh, I think that the people they get confused about the implant timing and then about the timing of the soft tissue. Some of the people they want to place the implant uh, at the time of tooth extraction. Then you may uh, ask yourself when I do the soft tissue uh, management. Uh, some of the people, they want to do an early implant placement, six to eight weeks after tooth extraction. And then, again, when uh, do you perform the connective tissue crafting? I must say that for me, uh, in my practice, today, when I want to get an aesthetic outcome, I do a soft tissue management in every case. But then I think it's very important because if you decide to do immediate implant placement, then there is a specific timing to do the soft, the, the, the soft tissue management. If you do early implant placement, there is another timing. If you decide to do uh, uh, to, to graft the socket at the time of tooth extraction, then it's a different scenario. So I think that today the people, they get confused. Uh, you know, today it's very trendy to do immediate implant placement. Okay, but then you have to discuss what is the indication and when you can uh, perform the soft tissue uh, management. Exactly. Well, now I, I know you have prepared several cases with several uh, situations, yes. timings, and techniques. Um, before that, uh, let's leave this case as a as a cliffhanger, right? Because we see an aesthetic complication, and obviously we want to know what we can do when we come across a patient with this, and how we can prevent this. But you promise me this is all the way at the end of your slide deck. You will reveal that to us. So I hope everybody uh, joins us uh, for the full hour to uh, figure out what you've done in this case, specifically ahead of us. And I think what is important, Gerrit, is that I think that today we can avoid this type of situation. If we select the right implant timing, yep. if we manage the soft tissue, then we can uh, avoid in most of the situation long-term aesthetic complication. Because I think that when you get this case in your practice, it's, it's a difficult situation. Uh, another information, because I, I expect uh, the audience, they will uh, think about what to do with this case. This is a cemented restoration, uh, which is even tricky because it's not that easy to remove uh, the prosthetic restoration. Of course, you can do it. Uh, but then you have to manage two things, the soft tissue uh, shrinkage, but also the, the shadow. And at the end of the session, I, I, I will show you how we manage the, the case. Exactly. So maybe I go to the first case. Yeah, well, before we do that, let's prove the fact that we're super live and, and we're question driven because we have a first question and I, I know we're now totally messing up our structure, but that's that's why we're live. I, I see a question coming in from Mustafa Hussein, who's actually joining us from Iraq tonight. So uh, uh, glad to have you with us, Mustafa. And he, he's asking a question regarding the, the tissue graft. He's writing, which in your opinion or in science, we always differentiate uh, uh, between those two here at EAO, uh, which is better? autogenous connective tissue graft or an artificial mucoderm? Okay. Let's start with the science first. Are you aware of any studies into this? Yeah, there is, there is studies, but I think that uh, today uh, there is, I mean, everybody wants 
if possible, to avoid harvesting uh, connective tissue graft from the tuberosity or from the palate. So far, most of the available uh, documentation clearly show the superiority around the implant-supported restoration, the superiority of autogenous connective tissue graft. So uh, I would say that today, from my clinical experience, but also for the, from the available scientific evidence, we still have to use uh, the connective tissue graft from the patient. And again, I think that it's not that easy, particularly when you have to, uh, to restore or when you have to, uh, to manage one or two implants. It's not very important uh, connective tissue graft, so it's not uh, a very important uh, uh, issue to me. But exactly. still... Uh, would, would, would you say um, the word today almost underlined three times? Are you aware of any developments into artificial I, I mean, it will be the future for sure. We, we try to avoid as much as possible uh, the complexity of the surgery. It's important for the uh, patient uh, with the patient-related outcome uh, measurement, but it's also important for the practitioner. So for sure, uh, in the future, we will have new material that may uh, be able to, to really replace the connective tissue graft. So far, when you have to, to either to restore or to prevent uh, the occurrence of soft tissue recession or on implant supported restoration, I think that we have to stick to the use of connective tissue graft. Exactly, clear. Well, very clear and, uh, and great answer. Thanks for your question, uh, Mustafa. And this is then an invitation and a demonstration to all of you joining that if you have any questions, type them in the chat and we'll, we'll take them right away. Not, not too difficult, huh, the question, please. <laughs> well, well, we'll see, we'll challenge them. <laughs> well, like you said, let's take us into a, a first case of soft tissue management regarding timing and a certain technique. What, what, what can you share with us? Okay, so... Um, you know, the issue with this uh, topic, just to make clear uh, with the people about the, 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 the structure of the presentation, I think that it's important. We cannot talk about uh, the soft tissue management without talking about the timing of implant placement. Uh, so I think I'll start uh, with one. And, and just to be, be super clear to our audience, we have three options, right? It's immediate, I mean, yes. early, and late. If, yes. I mean, let's say immediate implant placement early implant placement, but then when we say late today, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's mean that at the time of uh, the tooth extraction, you place a bone substitute within uh, the socket, you wait, and then you place the, 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 the implant. I will not cover this part uh, of the, what we call the alveolar ridge preservation, because I do not use this surgical technique. We can, I mean, if there is any question from the audience, I can go in, in detail. But I think that the main issue with this technique, when you place a bone substitute at the time of the extraction, it's the quality of the bone uh, down the road. So you have to, to, we have to be clear, the mother na nature is the best. So if you let the uh, clot doing the job, it will be the best. If you place a bone substitute within the, 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 the socket, then it will delay uh, the healing and the issue is the quality of the bone. So if you delay the healing, you wait like three or four months, and if the quality of the bone is not sufficient, then I think it's it's a, it's an issue. So it's uh, so I will not cover this part because in my practice in the aesthetic zone, either we go for immediate implant placement in some specific indication, or we go for early implant placement, six to eight weeks after tooth extraction. So the, the first case I'd like to share with you is this uh, young uh, lady. Uh, as you can see, it, she has a high lip line. So uh, this is, a, I think, it, a difficult uh, case. It's very important uh, when you have a case uh, such as this one to evaluate the complexity of uh, the case uh, from scratch. And uh, here, the high lip line is one uh, important uh, parameter. As you can see, there is also a high papilla, and it's always difficult, uh, also from a prosthetic point of view, to restore this uh, type of papilla. I think that uh, I would like to stress this uh, for the audience. It's important to take picture, because as you can see, we have already a soft tissue rotation around uh, 221, and there is a missing distal papilla. So it's also important, because sometimes the patient, they have 
very important expectation regarding the final aesthetic outcome. And of course, if you start with uh, soft tissue rotation, you may tell the patient that maybe it's not possible uh, to, to improve. Of course, here uh, on the buccal aspect, we have some option to improve the final outcome, but sometimes, particularly for, for the papilla, it might be difficult. And when you have um, a recession uh, of the papilla before starting the case, it might be uh, very difficult to, to restore. So I think it's very important to discuss this with the patient uh, on the big, uh, at the beginning, because of course, if there is uh, anything down the road, it's, it's always better if uh, it was discussed with the patient uh, previously. Exactly. This is the clinical, sorry. Yeah, yeah no, in the meantime, I just want to make a, a quick shout out to Helge from Norway. He's posting a question. I've seen it, but we're, let, let's first cover this first case and then we'll do a little Q&A break in between. Please yes. continue, uh, David. So first, I think it's, uh, it's nice to see whether this is, I mean, what I call initial case. Uh, it's, it's always easier if the tooth is still there because sometimes particularly uh, when uh, the dentists are only doing the surgery, sometimes uh, they see the patient in the first appointment without uh, the tooth. And of course, it's much more difficult to manage the timing. So of course, when the tooth is still there, it's, it's better because then you can decide whether you go for immediate implant placement or early uh, implant uh, placement. As I just told you, it's highly pliant. So, so this is a very important parameter to evaluate. If there is a low lip line, be careful because some of the patients, they are shy and uh, maybe they may have the soft tissue recession for a long time and they get you know, the habit to hide this, uh, this uh, unpleasant uh, aesthetic appearance. So you have to be careful. If there is a high lip line, be careful because that means that you, you have no room for a failure. But if there is a low lip line, sometimes down the road, the low lip line will become high lip line. So be <laughs> careful. It's an interesting tip. So, so from clinical practice, what do you do when you come across, you, you take the photo, you see the low yes. lip line, how do you validate that this is a real low lip line or a developed think, low lip line? I think it's impossible. I think if you, high, you, have a, you get a high lip line, you know that it's a very risky situation. Yeah. If it's a low lip line, be careful. Because most of the time, you know, the people, they say you have to do an aesthetic evaluation prior uh, to the case. And then if it's a low lip line, then it's, it's good. It's not yeah. so risky. Yeah. Just uh, stress the point that it's, sometimes you have a low lip line when you start the case. And at the end of the case, it's a high lip line. So yeah. if there is you say a there's no way to determine up front, but you'll, you'll come across these cases. In so the, I think it, yeah. it's, it's important to, to know also because, I mean, uh, we are talking about a few... Uh, uh, millimeters. I mean, if you have 0.5 soft tissue rotation with this patient, then it will be an aesthetic failure. If there is a low lip line, sometimes 0.5 millimeter of soft tissue rotation might not be an issue. And we all have to be aware that in this field, 0.5 millimeter might be very difficult to reach and to get. So sometimes it's a lot of surgery just for this 0.5 millimeter. So if it's not necessary, then go for something easier for the patient. So. This is also something very important. Evaluate the complexity of the case at the beginning and also the expectation of uh, the, the patient. The shape of the, of the tooth, I think it's a very important parameter. As you can see on this uh, picture, we have a triangular tooth shape, tooth shape and it's, uh, uh, again, a little bit more difficult to restore than uh, when the, the shape is more square. That this color should be evaluated. Uh, as well as the adjacent uh, teeth in order to evaluate the, the, the complexity of the uh, prosthetic restoration. So this is a, a closer view. I'll share with you now the, the X-ray. So as you can see, uh, this is the, the, the um, periapical radiograph, but also the cone beam CT scan. There is a, an important root resorption uh, below the, the bone level. And uh, of course, as a periodontist, uh, I, I love and I try as much as possible to save uh, teeth, particularly in the, in the static zone. But here, I think that there is no way uh, to, to save these uh, tooth. So for me, this, of course, this tooth is uh, hopeless. So here, 
uh, as soon we have decided that this uh, tooth is hopeless, we have to decide about the timing. When do we place the implant? Do we go for immediate uh, implant uh, placement? Do we go to uh, an early implant uh, placement? So maybe you can think about this uh, situation. As you can see from the cone beam CT scan, it seems that the bone volume on the buccal aspect is not very important, but we all know that uh, sometimes uh, the, the picture from the X-ray is uh, worse than uh, the clinical situation, but still you have to, to take the decision here. When do I place the implant? If it's immediate, when do I uh, manage the soft tissue? And if it's an early implant placement, when uh, do I manage the soft tissue? So maybe, Garrett, you want me to share what uh, we did with this case? or Yes, 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 please. Yeah, because okay. uh, hopeless case, we need to come into action. What did you do? So uh, in this situation, for me, this is not a good indication for uh, immediate implant placement. I, I think we, will, we may discuss later on, if we have time, the, what are the indications for immediate implant placement. But uh, briefly, I think that when there is no uh, cortical bone, I think it's a very high risk uh, to go for immediate implant placement. So in that particular situation, I would recommend, and uh, I did an early implant uh, placement. So. Uh, before, of course, the extraction, you have to, to prepare a provisional uh, a restoration. So here it's a bonded uh, bridge without any preparation on the, on the adjacent uh, teeth. And you go for uh, natromatic uh, tooth extraction. Of course, it's not always easy uh, in, the, in, the, in the aesthetic zone. The aim is to avoid uh, to reflect the flap and uh, to touch the, the papilla. So a traumatic tooth extraction, and then you can place uh, the bonded uh, bridge. And then you have to wait uh, six to eight weeks. As you can see, I only place a collagen uh, sponge within uh, uh, the socket. This is just to reduce the size of the clot. Uh, it's not, uh, the impact is not uh, very important. I think there is not a lot of scientific evidence uh, to use a collagen uh, sponge. Maybe there is no, not a huge difference, but this is, the way we proceed in the, uh, the practice. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the surgery, this surgery, you have to wait uh, six to eight weeks. Uh, this is a very nice timing, six to eight weeks, because of course, down the road, after six to eight weeks, uh, you will have a, a soft tissue healing. So there is one aspect you do not have to, to, to manage, as compared, of course, uh, with immediate implant placement, where you have to manage uh, the fact that the, the tooth has just been uh, extracted. So here is the situation. Of course, uh, six weeks after tooth extraction, you, you have uh, already some bone remodeling. And this is also one of the main advantage of the early implant placement is that um, most of the bone remodeling has already occurred. And uh, so again, this is and, and one of what, the... What, what is the effect of this six to eight weeks on the soft tissue? After six to eight weeks, you have a soft tissue healing. So full it's a, uh, sorry? It, there is a full healing. Of the soft tissue, yes. yes. Not of the bone. So oh, of course, of course. Yeah. it's the woven uh, bone, but from the soft tissue aspect, uh, it's already healed. And this is a very important uh, aspect for us because at this moment, we clearly know that the bone will not be sufficient. So the early implant placement is always associated with a guided bone regeneration. So you extract the tooth, you wait six weeks. At six weeks, you have a very good soft tissue healing that will allow you to place the implant together with the guided bone regeneration. And we all know also from some of the publications from Trombelli, for example, that six to eight weeks is a very nice moment to place the implant and to perform the guided bone regeneration from a cell's point of view. So it's, it's, um, it's a nice moment because the bone remodeling must, I think that more than 50% of the bone remodeling has already uh, occurred. Uh, there is a lot of publication on this topic from the group of uh, Danny Buzer and uh, the main author is, uh, is Viviane Chapuis. Very nice publication that clearly show that six to eight weeks is a nice moment uh, to place the implant with simultaneous guided bone regeneration. So here is the, is the situation. After six weeks, 
in uh, with an occlusal view. And as you can see, there is already a kind of soft tissue shrinkage because of the underlying bone remodeling. So here we have to, to place the implant. Of course, when we are dealing with the with implant in the aesthetic zone, it's of primary importance to place the implant uh, uh, perfectly, prosthetically uh, driven using a surgical guide whenever uh, possible. And of course, in that situation, as you can see uh, on the right uh, picture, there is uh, a bone defect, a buccal bone uh, defect, and uh, you have to, to, of course, to correct this uh, bony defect. We like before uh, uh, building the bone around the implant and restoring the, the buccal defect, we like to take an impression. So this is a very simple impression uh, in order to be able to prepare in the lab uh, a provisional restoration. So it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's an indexing uh, technique just to register the position of the, uh, the implant. And then you can uh, start the guided bone regeneration. I think that uh, there is several uh, options at this stage, depending of the, of the uh, bone uh, defect. Here, as you can see, the implant is within the bony envelope. So it's, uh, it's not a very difficult situation. Uh, and that's why I think you can use a resorbable uh, membrane. Of course, when you have to build the bone uh, outside the bony envelope, then I think you may uh, prefer the use of a non-resorbable membrane. Also here, we only have to manage a horizontal bony defect. And uh, again, if there is a vertical and horizontal bony defect, a combined uh, defect, then the non-resorbable titanium reinforced membrane uh, must be the choice. So here, it's only an horizontal bony defect within the bony envelope, no vertical bony defect, so we can use a resorbable membrane. As soon as you decide to use a resorbable membrane, then you know that you have to go, I mean, to overcontour, because with the pressure of the soft tissue, I mean, the resorbable membrane will not sustain the pressure of the soft tissue. So as soon as you use a resorbable membrane, then you have to overcontour the uh, restoration. That's why you can see a lot of bone substitute on the buccal aspect of the, uh, uh, the implant in order to counteract the pressure of the soft tissue on the buccal aspect. Sorry. And uh, of course, I, there is not the picture with the, the membrane. At this stage, you place the membrane. It's, it's of primary importance to make, uh, to make sure the membrane is uh, stable. So you can use tacks or pins uh, or a combination with a suturing technique, but it's, it's of primary importance that the membrane is stable. Then you close the site, and this is also why uh, it's of primary importance to have a soft tissue healing, because you have to place um, uh, everything under uh, the gengiva. And then you have to wait for uh, the healing. In that particular situation, we have wait four months. One of the questions might be, why uh, can you manage the soft tissue at this stage? Mm -hmm. uh, from a technical point of view, this is possible. Uh, we don't like uh, to manage the soft tissue at this stage because as you can see, uh, on the buccal aspect of the implant, you have the bone substitute and then the bone substitute will be covered by a membrane. So if you add a connective tissue graft at this stage, then the vascularization of the connective tissue graft will only come from the buccal flap. And we believe it, this is not sufficient. So you will lose part of the graft. That's why in this particular uh, timing of implant placement, we prefer to place the implant with uh, the guided bone regeneration, wait, let's say three to five months, depending on the size of the bony defect. And then the management of the soft tissue will be performed at the time of uncovering at when we place uh, the, the healing abutments. Mm -hmm. So what is important, tell me, Gerrit. 
Uh, well, there's, a, there's a, yeah, 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 you see the finger. There's a, there's a question coming in very practical. Well, there's a, a few questions coming in. So, Victor, I saw your question coming as well. I, I'm saving that together with Helga's and Sharif's question because they're a bit more broader. But Fotios Papos is sending a question. Uh, he, he's watching and joining us from Edinburgh. And he's sending a question specifically about this case. And he's asking, what was your flap design? I think it's a nice segue. Yes. Into the next so I, this is a very important uh, question. This is a single uh, tooth. So we only need, uh, I believe, one relating incision. So the first incision, uh, I have no mouse here, but uh, on the left picture, you can see that there is a crestal incision, slightly palatal. And then you have intracellular incision on the adjacent uh, teeth. On the on tooth uh, eleven, on tooth uh, twenty two, and then on tooth twenty three, there will be distally a relieving incision. So maybe you can see it uh, more easily uh, from this uh, view. Okay, so it's uh, intracellular incision, and there is only one relieving incision distal to the canine. Most of the situation, even if you can avoid any core tissue with releasing incision. We prefer to place the releasing incision distal to the canine. If you have two uh, implants in the aesthetic zone, then maybe you have to use two releasing incision and always as much as possible distal to the canine. One important uh, uh, parameter from a technical point of view, the aim of this releasing incision uh, is of course that at the end of the surgery you will uh, uh, augment the bone and then you have to be able to close the soft tissue without any tension. That's why you will have to release the periostom, uh, of course, and uh, the distal relieving incision will be uh, pretty helpful. But then in most of the situation, the, the, the place where it will be difficult to get this uh, flexibility of the flap, it's around the central uh, adjacent uh, incisor. And then that's why uh, it's important uh, to release also the flap in this area. Uh, but then without any relieving incision, it's a little bit more difficult and uh, it's, it's kind of envelope technique to release the flap also in front of uh, tooth 11 in that uh, slide. Exactly. Well, now, now the real magic of uh, this EEO Just Ask Live is happening. If you're just joining us, we're live talking to David Nissan about uh, uh, soft tissue management. We're in the middle of a first case of uh, early uh, implant. And Thomas from Zurich is asking, uh, when you were talking about the membrane, do you fix the membranes with pins buccally or palatally? Yeah, this is a very good uh, question. I mean, the best option... Normally, it's to start uh, palatally and then uh, buccally. So you use two pins on the palatal side, uh, and then you can place the bone substitute, and you finish uh, with two pins on the buccal area. This is uh, the best scenario. Of course, in some situations, it might be tricky. So in my practice, when I can do this, I prefer to, to start with the palatal area and then the buccal area. In some cases, I have to start uh, uh, buccally, and then I may use some suturing technique on the palatal uh, side as well. Exactly, yeah, but beautiful. But the immobility of the, of the membrane is, is a very important parameter, and I think we have some very nice uh, publication from the School of Zurich uh, on this topic that clearly show the impact of the, of the mobility of the, of the membrane if there is no uh, tacking of the membrane. Exactly. Well, and, and still, I'm still recognizing Helga, uh, uh, Victor, and Sharif, your questions. I'm, I'm parking them until we finish the case, because now Tung Berge, who is joining us from Istanbul, is also uh, referring with a question to the case. You just mentioned you wait three to five months after the guided bone regeneration, and how long you have to wait for healing after the soft tissue management, he writes. Yeah, but it, this is a very important question, but it depends on the situation. In that particular case, it's a difficult case, and uh, I think we wait about four months. And four months after the implant placement, you have to look at your case and to look at the soft tissue. In that particular case, there is still, in spite of the guided bone regeneration, we have a soft tissue defect 
an horizontal soft tissue defect, but also a vertical soft tissue defect. This is a very important parameter. You have to look at the soft tissue in order to define which technique I may use. If you have a vertical soft tissue, and remember, on this case, the distal papilla was already missing at the very beginning. So you know that you may have to increase uh, the, the, the tissue vertically. So in that case, after four months, you look at the case. And as you will see with the early implant placement, I will share with you three techniques to manage the soft tissue. Here, we have a vertical soft tissue defect after implant placement. So this is one technique to be performed. Excellent. So maybe I share with you the technique when there is a vertical soft tissue defect. Uh, yeah, you oh. could. Um, um, well, let, let's stay on topic a little bit. Okay. Park, go show us, because I know you have it ready. Because now, obviously, both Fotios uh, and, and Thomas are coming back with a follow-up question. So the, the thing is working, and I'm trying to keep the uh, conversation structured. Let me know. If you... Fotios, Fotios asked about the flap design, and then his follow-up question is, so the answer was clear. He says, thank you. But what suturing technique were you using in this case? OK, so maybe I have to, this, after placing the implant and the guided bone regeneration, you have to release the flap in order to be able to close without any tension. And then uh, the first suturing technique is, a mat, is an horizontal mattress suture in order to close the tissue. This suture is very important because it will take the, the, the tension in a way. So you have to place an horizontal mattress suture uh, on the crestal incision. Normally, one uh, horizontal mattress suture is sufficient. Then you can uh, close with, uh, and for this, I use a 5.0 Gore-Tex suture. Then you can use interrupt uh, suture, and I would recommend to use 6.0 uh, proline suture. Then so then it's it's classical suturing. You suture the, the crystal incision, and you may finish with the relieving incision. Beautiful. Very, very practical advice here tonight on, uh, on, on how to perform do you think, the operation. Do you want me to, to show the other techniques? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, to, maybe to kind of, uh, also, yeah. we can uh, maybe later on, I think we have some video about the, the suturing technique. Well, uh, f feel free to, to jump around in your, in your slide deck. Eh? As we said before, we're yes. not fixed on slides. I mean, they're here to tell you a story if there's no questions. But there uh, are Maybe, maybe I just go uh, uh, to show you the, the suturing technique if you want, Gerrit. Yeah, yeah, please do. Please do. Okay. I mean, if, we, if we have visual material ready for us, um, let's uh, take it. And then uh, when, when we finish this case, I'll, I'll take the, uh, the, the little bit broader questions from, uh, from Helge and Sharif and Victor. And Thomas also comes back now to a, a follow-up question. But let's, let's round this topic off. OK, I'll just finish the case because I'm not sure it's uh, right there. OK. Let's finish the case, and then it, it's coming. Uh, I'll just put this, because then I will look down anyway. Yeah, because you, 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 you finished, you said, I have to wait four to five months. That's where we were, right? Yes. So, and then you evaluate the case. And in that particular situation, there is a vertical defect. If you have a vertical defect, it means that you have to build the soft tissue on the implant. Okay. And uh, of course, you have to first harvest the connective tissue graft. And then it's important to place the connective tissue graft over the implant shoulder. So after the implant placement and the guided bone regeneration, wait, let's say three to five months, and then you evaluate the case. If there is a vertical soft tissue defect, then you have to place the connective tissue graft over the implant shoulder, which means that you cannot place the healing abutment in the same times. So in this particular situation, you only perform the connective tissue graft, and then you wait again. I know it's a lot of surgery. But does, does, does this then, because now the, the landscape changes, does this then also re, uh, uh, require a, a new and a different provisionary prosthetic as well? No. It's still you, the same. You can place the same version. one back. You can yeah, remove yeah. it. Of course, it's an issue because you have to remove it and to bond it again. But uh, this is not, a, I mean, in daily okay. clinical practice, uh, this is not uh, an issue. So here you harvest the connective tissue graft either from the palate or from the tuberosity. We can see the surgical technique later on. And then you place the connective tissue graft over 
the cover screw. And you close the site again. Uh, here it's, uh, it's an, un an envelope technique, so you don't need a relieving incision in that particular situation. It's only a crystal incision to uh, intracellular incision. Of course, you have to release slightly uh, the flap uh, on the buccal area. Uh, of course, a guided bone regeneration was performed, so you have to go uh, uh, with a partial thickness flap. And then you close, because you close everything again. Again, the aim of this surgery is to correct a soft, a vertical soft tissue deficiency. Here you have to wait four to six weeks, and then you can do the healing abutment placement or the placement of the provisional restoration, because as you remember, we uh, take uh, a small uh, impression at the time of implant placement. So in that particular situation, four to six weeks after the connective tissue graft, you do a very, very small opening just over the implant uh, uh, shoulder, you remove the cover screw and you place either the healing abutment or directly uh, the provisional restoration. This provisional restoration was prepared in the lab, so the, 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 the color and the shape is, is almost uh, perfect, and then you can start playing uh, with the, the tissue. Right. So this is uh, uh, the situation. Uh, and I will share with you uh, the case down the road. And as you can see here, the distal papilla is not perfect. So you still have to play with the uh, provisional restoration, increase uh, the size of the pro provisional restoration, trying to compress the distal papilla. And down the road, you are able to improve the, the outcome. And this is the final uh, restoration and the outcome after seven years. This is not a perfect outcome, I, I would say, uh, but this is a, a difficult situation. But um, the, the patient is, is happy, and the final uh, smile line is, uh, is, is, is okay. I'm just, just for the untrained eye here, David, why, why would you say this is not perfect? Uh, I think that, sorry, because I, I, yeah, yeah, I think that uh, I would say that the, uh, I should have correct the soft tissue also on the lateral uh, teeth because as you can see on the on the right quadrant there is a, a small recession that has increased down the road and yeah. uh, i think that the color of the final uh, restoration is not uh, is not perfect or of course it's a uh, it's a high it says a perfectionist yes because we're when, in the aesthetic zone and yeah when we are i mean here for the patient, it's uh, the extraction, the implant placement, the connective tissue graft, and the uh, uncovering. It's for, you have four surgery for this final outcome. So it's a lot of surgery. And of course, the patient, they, uh, they expect the best uh, final outcome. So I think here, uh, there is still room from, for improvement. So in this situation, just to summarize, it's early implant placement, four to eight weeks after tooth extraction. Then we place the implant with guided bone regeneration. When we evaluate the case, after four months, there is a vertical soft tissue defect. So you have to place the connective tissue graft over the implant shoulder, which means that you cannot place the healing abutment or the provisional restoration. So you have to build the soft tissue, wait for one month, and then you can place the provisional restoration. Again, the provisional restoration is mandatory in order to reach uh, an adequate uh, outcome, as you can see. With the provisional restoration, we still uh, modify the provisional restoration in order to guide the healing and to, to reach uh, the final uh, outcome. Exactly. Now, Lucretia, has, uh, Lucretia Holtzman has a question uh, specifically about that. She asks, so for how long do you condition the tissues with the implant-supported provisional um, prior to the definitive restoration? Yeah, it, it, again, it, it's uh, related to the case. In that particular case, it was about it was three months of uh, conditioning. Uh, but then, I mean, uh, in some situation for patient uh, uh, um, appointment, uh, you may stay with uh, the provisional restoration for six months. But most of the time, you need uh, two to three months to finalize the case and to, to guide slowly the, the soft tissue, particularly in that case where, uh, of course, there is still a lot to do uh, with the provisional restoration because the surgery and the connective tissue graft are not sufficient. But then you have to 
to build the soft tissue and you have to go slowly. Uh, when you place the provisional restoration, you have some uh, bleaching. This is normal, but of course, you have to be uh, uh, accurate and not too aggressive. So normally, five to 10 minutes after placing the provisional restoration, even if there is compression, the bleaching should uh, um, uh, reduce, of course. Uh, and you have to be careful because if there is too many pressure with the provisional restoration, you may... Uh, uh, it may lead to uh, a soft tissue recession. So it's uh, it's tricky. Exactly. Now, for, for the sake of time, because we're already kind of entering, if, if we aim for this virtual appointment to yes. be one hour, we're entering our last quarter, and I have quite some questions pending from, uh, from right. Helga, Sharif, Victor, so we're going to take those. And I guess we need to conclude that if we want here on the EO channel provide a clear overview of our potential techniques, we need to ask you back one more time and to go deeper into our Good. other options. Um, I think the, I first take Sharif's second question because it, it could be related to the case we just uh, went through. And then uh, let, let me uh, uh, pull us back in the, in the screen as well. So if this patient, and, and I'm assuming, and Sharif, tell me if it wasn't, if this is related to your first question, but if this patient comes with a speech error in the letter S, what is your decision then? Would that mean anything for your protocol in this case? Say it again. <laughs> it's it, it, the, the question, and I'm just reading out what it says here. It says, if this patient comes with a speech error in the letter S, so they have, they, they okay. have a, a problem with their speech with the letter S, would that affect your uh, protocol as no. you described? Not at all. Not, Not at all. all. I mean, here, uh, my decision with regard to the timing is that I think that uh, we cannot go for immediate implant placement, at least not in my end. I think it's too risky. So I think that the only uh, option for the timing is the, is the early implant placement. Then, uh, of course, for the soft tissue, again, it's, it's the evaluation, it's the healing of the patient. Maybe this patient, and it will be the, the next cases, in some of these cases, you just have a, a small horizontal soft tissue defect, and then it's not the same surgical technique. But um, the speech error would not uh, definitely change my uh, surgical attitude. Exactly. Okay, thank you for that. Um, uh, and I'm having a slight hint that it could be related to his first question, but we'll get to that uh, in a second. I hope uh, Helge Oyri is still with us from Norway because he posted a question quite a while back, uh, but it's a bit of a what about question. So it wasn't related to the case, but here it comes. He says, what about forced eruption before extraction and immediate implant or immediate provis provisionalization? Um, what I think, about? So you just want you yes, to no, no, it's good, elaborate. Good I think on that the topic. Um, to, to point uh, forced eruption. I mean, if you have a look at the root resorption, I think it's uh, you won't be able to 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 do forced eruption. And then again, the issue, the main issue, if you want to do immediate implant placement, is the uh, cortical bone. If there is no cortical bone, then I think uh, you should not and you should avoid using an immediate implant placement. Why? only for a uh, biological reason. I mean, when, and we can uh, maybe see a video later on, but uh, if time is, uh, is still uh, available, but if you do immediate implant placement without bone on the buccal aspect, it will not be possible to restore the bone volume uh, predictably. Okay, well, if, if you have a video ready to show us, I mean, uh, yes. pull it up. Eh? About yeah, the immediate yeah. implant placement, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'll I mean, just... Uh, uh, we're live. So we're live. Let's, so let's, let's make use of all the content we can provide to our okay. audience. Uh, just because I think that we all have to, to, to understand very clearly that if you want to be on the safe side, if you treat a patient with high aesthetic expectation, if you cannot afford to have 0.5 millimeter of soft tissue rotation. And I uh, urge you to look at the uh, uh, available scientific publication, which clearly show that in many, many, many situations with immediate implant placement, you have soft tissue rotation, even in, in good cases with uh, sick soft tissue and with a cortical bone, you still have a high risk for uh, soft tissue rotation. So very, very careful. I just uh, like to share with you the key elements uh, if you look at the, the, uh, today the uh, 
uh, available uh, um, scientific documentation, immediate implant placement should be uh, recommended when you have intact socket wall. So mm -hmm. at least, I mean, you need to have the, the, the buccal wall. Uh, it's important that the facial bony wall is, uh, I will put it in the full screen, yeah. At least you, one you need to reshare your screen as well because we're okay, not sorry. at the moment. Yeah. I'll yeah, share yeah, it yeah. again. Thank you uh, for this, Garrett. Yes. So these are the key elements if you want to do immediate implant placement. Again, in the aesthetic zone. We talk about the aesthetic zone uh, when you cannot afford a soft tissue uh, recession. Important to have the facial bone, sick soft tissue, no acute infection. I know there is publication showing that you can place implant even if there is an infection. But in the aesthetic zone, if you want to reach and on the on the safe uh, side, and then the surgical technique. Maybe we we see the the video. It's much better. So here, look at this case. We have a root uh, fracture. So again, you have to extract the tooth as carefully as uh, possible. Look at the tissue, very sick, soft tissue. Uh, and of course, it's not the case in, I mean, it's rarely the case. Then you check the facial bone. Uh, the facial bone is intact. So we have sick, soft tissue, intact facial bone. So you can go for immediate implant placement. You have to prepare the, the implant uh, uh, bed on the palatal aspect. And then you can prepare a socket uh, between the soft tissue and the facial bone. Do, do stuff, I understand now by the way you explain this, David, that, that you decide this on the spot? So you decide no, I mean, the protocol the, when you examine the, the, the situation after extraction? Sometimes. I mean, I just... Uh, yeah, pull, pull the video a bit back. Yeah. In most of the situation, I mean, uh, uh, you know before the surgery, but in some situation, you may decide uh, at the time of the surgery. And uh, there is a very nice publication from Tonetti and co-worker in 2017 that clearly show, I mean, they compare immediate implant placement with uh, early implant placement. And they clearly show that one of the issues in daily clinical practice, not in the university, one of the issues is that sometimes you uh, prepare your case for immediate implant placement. And at the end, you cannot place the implant uh, the day of the extraction. So it's, it's also an issue in the workflow of the, of the office. When you uh, decide to do early implant placement, in most of the situation, you can do the early implant placement. And if you cannot place the implant, you can still do the guided bone regeneration. If you tell the patient, I will place the implant the day I extract the tooth, if you do not place the implant, then it's, the management of the patient is not the same. So this is a very, very important uh, point. For the workflow, sometimes immediate implant placement might be an issue. So here... Uh, for me, in my practice, this is, I mean, I have few cases like that because uh, most of the time when I have to extract a tooth in the aesthetic zone, there is no more cortical bone because I have a root fracture or I have a very severe defect. And this is why I start my presentation with um, the, the statement from uh, Yuli saying that in 90% of the case, there is a bony defect. And if there is a bony defect, if you want to be on the safe side, do not use an immediate implant placement. Here we have sick tissue. Facial bone is present, so you can place the implant. But still, if you want to counteract the bone remodeling, because we all know here, I think that when you extract a tooth, atraumatically, without relieving a flap, still you will have bone remodeling on the facial aspect. If you want to counteract this bone remodeling, you have to place a connective tissue graft between the soft tissue and the cortical bone, and you have to place a bone substitute in the gap between the implant and the cortical bone. So as you can see, the management of the soft tissue when you do an immediate implant placement should be performed at the time of implant placement. That's why I think we have to emphasize the fact that soft tissue management is directly related to the timing of the, the implant. So here, connective tissue graft, and uh, yeah. we'll finish the, the video. Yeah. Uh, Bone substitute is placed. And again, you know, why do we need the facial bone? If there is no facial bone, you will place the bone substitute in direct contact with connective tissue graft. If you place the bone substitute in contact with the connective tissue graft, you will get uh, the, some pre tissue. So if you want to get bone, you have to place the bone substitute in contact with bone. So here, 
um, with this type of uh, uh, surgical protocol, you may reach uh, uh, a nice aesthetic outcome. Maybe I can show you the... So I think it's not the same case, but here you can see uh, uh, the, the type of uh, outcome you, we can get. But I think this case, this case is nice because, you know, the issue when you do immediate implant placement is that you have to evaluate the quantity of bone remodeling. And sometimes it's not that easy. So you have to over control in order to be sure that you, have on the, you are on the safe side. Exactly. Well, well, thanks for that elaboration. I am aware that uh, both with our questions and, and our discussion that we're going much broader than just the soft tissue management, but obviously it proves that this topic is very much related to all the other decisions we make. And that is my segue into Victor Palari's uh, question that came in a, a while back. Victor, I hope you're still with us. Um, and because he's asking, which uh, the, the effect on your protocol choice in case of periodontitis? So he, uh, he writes, which protocol, either immediate, early, or conventional implant placement in the aesthetic area, will you recommend in patients with a history of severe periodontitis? Okay, I mean, when there is a patient with severe periodontitis, then uh, there is several parameters. First of all, you have to treat the periodontal disease uh, first. And, Before you do uh, anything, yeah. Yes, this is, this is mandatory. And uh, treating the periodontitis means also to remove any deep pocket. We have very nice publication from Bjorni Peterson uh, back in 2012, I think, uh, clearly show that if there is a pocket deeper than five millimeter, after the periodontal treatment, then there is a higher risk for biological complications. So if you have a periodontally compromised patient, of course, you have to treat the periodontal disease first. And then uh, you have to be aware that the level of expectation from, uh, for this type of patient is not the same. And so sometimes, I mean, uh, if the level of expectation is not that important and you can maybe afford having a 0.5 millimeter of soft tissue recession, then maybe you can go for immediate implant placement. I mean, the, the timing of implant placement is related to the bone and to the expectation. If there is a disease, you have to treat the disease and make sure the disease is treated. And then you have to uh, uh, um, include the patient in supportive therapy. So, I mean, perio patient means treatment and a follow-up, not a major impact on the uh, surgical technique, I think. Exactly. Exactly. Now, I'm just going to run through the questions as they come in. Uh, and <laughs> Thomas is posting more questions. I'm still getting at your previous uh, question, Thomas uh, uh, E87 from Zurich, uh, because he earlier also asked when we were talking about the case, do you use autogenous bone chips on the yes. implant like Buzo does, or do you mix the autogenous? And, and then what is your rate you're aiming at? Uh, okay, I'll maybe I have... Uh, Maybe I'll show you the, the next case because I think we can... Ah, uh, ah. But I, no? I do think we have, we have time okay, well, to no time. cases okay. because we also uh, had the cliffhanger to do, right? Yes. So let, let's just throw in yes. some answers. We, uh, we use a mixture. I mean, uh, there is very nice publication from Janssen, again, that clearly show that using autogenous bone mixed with bovine bone mineral is a, is a very good mixture. Uh, in the protocol uh, from Buzer in 2008, they place the autogenous bone graft over the exposed uh, thread of the implant, and then they place the bone substitute. Uh, we do the same. We place first the bone uh, substitute over the uh, thread of the implant, and then we use a, a, a mixture of bone substitute with autogenous bone graft in order to speed up uh, the bone uh, formation. Exactly. Good. Um... Next question. Like I said, I'm just firing a bunch of questions to you. It's a bit random, but it's also a service to our viewers who took the effort to uh, submit uh, the viewers. Just, uh, yeah. um, in the meantime, you get a thanks from Victor, a thanks from Thomas, and uh, uh, three rounds of applause from uh, Jana Spasic. So uh, uh, you're doing well, uh, David. Um, Sharif is referring to the previous case. So and, and, and judging the timing when the question came in, that is the case we, we did elaborately. He's asking, what about using an orthodontic extraction protocol instead of simple one, the simple one to permit composition of bone in the socket or the width of the alveolar ridge won't be enough too? So he's basically asking, 
your opinion on whether you could use an orthodontic extraction protocol in that case instead of the extraction? I mean, uh, again, when you have an external root resorption with this uh, importance uh, on a previous crown, then I think uh, it might be really difficult to use uh, an orthodontic uh, extraction. Of course, it's an option. Uh, you have to be aware that it takes time. And then after, uh, you have uh, also to make sure you, because what is important is the uh, facial bony wall. And I'm not sure with the technique you will get some more facial bone. So it will not improve. It might improve a little bit the, the soft tissue, but uh, I think that the price uh, to pay is very important. Good. Um, a follow-up reaction from Helgi Oiri, remember, from Norway. He asked you about the forced eruption, and he says, I, I agree. I would not use the forced eruption if there's a root re resorption, but... This is otherwise a non-surgical way of thickening and increasing the soft tissue labially. I guess that's more of a comment yes. than a question. <laughs> Thank you, Helga, for that. Um, then Thomas is posting uh, a, a few questions. Sherry says thank you, so he's happy uh, with your answer. Thomas is writing, um, what about the long-term aesthetic outcomes in the optimal situation? Um, is there a real advantage of type 1 implant placements besides time? I mean, type one is. I think he meaning uh, just. I think it means immediate, right? In immediate case. implant placement. I think that the main advantage of immediate implant placement is to reduce the number of surgery first, and it might uh, be an advantage when you have very triangle tooth shape, because then it might be easier to manage the papilla, at least at the beginning. On the long run, I think there is no difference. The main issue is the indication. If you can go for immediate implant placement, it's a very nice protocol. But again, being on the safe side means thick, soft tissue, and facial bone. And if you are a periodontist, then most of the situation when you extract a tooth in the aesthetic zone, there is no uh, buccal bone. That's why, I mean, it's a good uh, option, but then I think there is not a lot of uh, uh, good indication. Exactly. Well, uh, let, let's take the last two questions and then we end obviously with the cliffhanger where you started with your first case and, and, and told us what can we do to deal with this and prevent this. But last two questions. Kataria Zwidnik is asking, do you use PRF for cases like this as well? So PRF for our viewers who are not familiar, it's platelet rich. Uh, Fibrin. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's the one. Uh, so uh, I think that there is a nice... Uh, uh, consensus uh, 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 conference, I mean, uh, publication from the EO during the last consensus conference on the use of the PRF. And I think that the statements are pretty clear. Uh, so far, uh, there is not a, a strong uh, scientific uh, evidence to support the use of PRF in daily clinical practice. I think that there is few evidence uh, for alveolar rich preservation. And as I told you uh, in the beginning, I think that there is really, 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 really few indication of the use of alveolar ridge preservation. So if I look at the EIO consensus conference regarding the use of PRF, few uh, evidence on the alveolar ridge preservation. But uh, again, I think this is not uh, um, uh, my option of choice in the aesthetic uh, zone. So of course, in that particular situation, I won't uh, use any uh, PRF. And again, we have a lot of scientific evidence uh, for immediate implant placement, a lot of scientific evidence on early implant placement, but there is not a lot of scientific evidence on the use of PRF in uh, those uh, techniques. Okay. So the short answer, do you use it? No. No. Uh, and we should be aware, there, this is a technique on the market. I remember a presentation at last EAO conference in Lisbon, uh, where th where this technique was also presented and demonstrated as a... As yeah, a just a give me two minutes just to show some one case very quickly. Please reshare your screen. And everything and, uh, everything and is, is clear for the people about this protocol. Just another case. As you can see, there is a, a fistula. I, I, the I took down your uh, slides again, so you need to put them back up for me. Okay. Thank you for telling me. Just to, that everything is, is, is clear. Here, uh, 221, there is a fistula on the buccal uh, area. Of course, there is a fistula, there is no bone. Okay. Uh, this is the, the X-ray. I go fast, but it's the same protocol. Just for you, that to make sure everything is uh, is uh, clearly understood. So you extraction, 
uh, without any uh, flap elevation. Uh, there is no uh, buckle bone. You wait six to eight weeks, then you place the implant in a correct 3D position. As you can see, of course, there is a bony defect. You build the bone. Here again, it's uh, not a very important bony defect. It's within the bony end lap, so you use a bone substitute uh, mixed with autogenous bone graft and cover with a resorbable membrane using some pins, and you wait again. So here is the situation. It will be later covered by a collagen membrane. This is the first layer of uh, crossing collagen membrane covered uh, by a second uh, layer. You close the flap and then you wait. So it's the same uh, surgical technique. Just to show you, uh, you have to look at the case after three to four months. So here is the healing. Look good. Okay, Gerrit? Mm -hmm. Are you happy with Agreed. this case? Yeah, yeah, it looks you good to me. Yeah, in the end, I'm not an implant dentist, but it looks As good. As you can see, me. there is no vertical soft tissue defect here. Almost okay. no defect. But still, if you look at the case here, there is a horizontal uh, defect. And in uh, let's say 90% of the case, when you go for early implant placement, you have only a horizontal soft tissue defect, like this one. Okay? This is the main uh, situation. So, here, what you can do, you can uh, uh, make a small incision over the cover screw, remove the cover screw, place a connective tissue graft on the buccal aspect together with the healing abutment. Okay? So, in my daily clinical practice, this is what I do in most of the clinical situation is early implant placement, and down the road, we have only a small horizontal soft tissue defect to correct, and then you can build nice uh, uh, soft tissue and place the final, uh, the final restoration. Well, this is just to, because I think it's important to share with the audience uh, what we do in most of the situation. Exactly. Now, skip forward to the end of your deck, and show us the cliffhanger which you promised okay. in the beginning. We saw a vertical defect, we saw a shadow. And, and Let's and go you, for the shadow. Yeah, you promised us what can we do about it and, and more importantly, what can we do to prevent it? Okay. So this is the case, okay? Uh, again, uh, I think it's very important to emphasize the importance of using screw retain restoration because if there is any complication, any biological complication or aesthetic complication down the road, it's so easy just to unscrew uh, the crown and check it and see whether you can uh, improve. And in that case, it's a cemented restoration. Of course, you can always remove it, but it's much more difficult, particularly when it's uh, an old restoration. There is always a risk to, to have to destroy uh, the old uh, crown. So in that particular situation, if you look at the papilla, they are pretty good. We are... Uh, 15 years after implant placement. So uh, it's not th that uh, easy. So what uh, we did in that uh, case, uh, we believe it's very important to avoid any elevation of the papilla. So we performed an envelope uh, technique, buccally and on the, the adjacent uh, teeth, and we placed a connective tissue graft within the envelope. Of course, there is no, uh, no more buccal bone, over the uh, buccal thread of the implant. So you have to be very careful. You have to, to use a connective tissue graft that, that is thick enough and long enough in order to get the vascularity from the adjacent uh, side. So uh, yeah, here is the, is the final outcome. So with this technique, in some cases, not all the cases, but in some of the cases, you can uh, manage uh, the complication. But of course, you have uh, always to look at the position of the, the implant. This is another situation. I, th I like this situation because this patient, this is a young patient. It's a complication. This is uh, only two or three years after implant placement. So here, it's an immediate implant uh, placement. Uh, not a good indication, of course. Maybe the surgical technique was not uh, adequate as well. And as you can see, it's a highly pliant and the aesthetic failure is, is important. So I'll just share with you the, the, the situation, the X-ray. And uh, uh, as you can see, the, the implant is very large and uh, very close to the adjacent teeth. So it's, it's a difficult situation because if we have to remove the implant, uh, then we may uh, have to jeopardize the prognosis of the, the adjacent lateral uh, teeth. So here, what is important is the position of the implant. 
Of course, the implant is too thick. I mean, it's, it's a large diameter implant, which is not good. The implant is not correctly placed, uh, is um, not deep uh, enough, as you can see on the right uh, picture. Luckily enough, the implant is uh, not too far buckly. Because if the implant is too far buccally, or if the buccal inclination is, is too important, then uh, it might be impossible to, to manage the case. In that situation, because the implant was, I mean, it was not possible to remove the implant, we have tried the same uh, surgical approach. So we performed an envelope technique on the, on the buccal aspect. Of course, uh, you can feel the thread of the implant, on the buccal aspect. This is not a peri-implantitis. Huh? Clearly, this is the bone remodeling after implant placement that lead to the soft tissue rotation. There is no infection there. Uh, again, we use a connective tissue graft harvested uh, from the palate, uh, and we place the connective tissue graft within the envelope. And then you try to corollarily place uh, the graft and the tissue in order to cover uh, the, the defect, and uh, we were lucky in this uh, situation. This is five years down the road, and uh, we were able to, to reach a nice aesthetic outcome. Of course, big, this is an, uh, um, a situation where we can uh, improve the final outcome because the implant was not perfectly placed, but uh, it was not too bad, let's say. Exactly, and the, the key learning, I guess, here is the protocol of going via the adjacent teeth, right? Creating the yes. envelope and going from the yes. side in. Don't touch the papilla, and it's really only an envelope in order to be able to, to get some vascularity because, of course, the issue is that you have the titanium uh, on the buccal aspect, so the connective tissue grafts should be long enough in order to get uh, the blood from the adjacent uh, sides. Great. Great. Well, David, I, I think we've uncovered the following. Let, let me make a shout out to Bernard Schweitz and also to uh, Henrik Homgaard, who also now start to send in their questions regarding, for example, soft tissue harvesting, which is an entire topic that we intended to uh, cover, but we're already 75 minutes into this live podcast. So uh, we're going to start to uh, round it up. So I think if, if, if I may, and I'm not the one to make this call, but I would like to invite you back, David, for at least one other just ask live session where we go deeper specifically into soft tissue harvesting, uh, graft harvesting and, and management, because it feels like we, we can also uh, really go uh, into that one. Um, yeah, I think it's better. And, and, and with that, I also uh, uh, want to read out, uh, well, I, I definitely want to invite you to make sure you read out the comments. There's one from Brenda that uh, she asked me to, uh, to read out to you all the way at the end of this uh, Just Ask Life, and that says, the French Society of per Periodontology and Implantology is proud of their president. Bravo. And this is in line, David, with a lot of the other comments, because I Thank think to, to all of you who are still watching, uh, tonight we wit witnessed the magic of this EAO Just Ask live session. You really participated very well. You interrupted, you, you clarified during the case, and David, uh, indeed, you were a great expert uh, answering all your questions and, and in great detail. And as you can see, there's much more to go. So I have good news for all of you who cannot get enough. First of all, there is a monthly Just Ask Live. So make sure you hit the subscribe button to the EO channel right now so you'll be the first to know when a new live session is scheduled. Also, you can go back and watch the other Just Asks with uh, Alberto Sogado about the sinus lift or with Michael Payet about ceramic implants and all the future ones from then on. And we invite you also in the future to submit your own cases. You can do that by going to eo.org uh, slash, and now I should read it out properly. I have my notes uncovered. The slash just ask case submission. And if you want to look up that link, it's also right here in the description of this video as well. And with that, uh, we, we come to the end of this one. If you know anybody who might be interested in soft tissue management, make sure you share this video with them either right now, tonight, or later throughout the days. So make sure all your colleagues and friends are able to get access to this, uh, to this knowledge, to this expertise. And uh, with that, David, I'd uh, like to uh, give a big, big thank you to you. Thanks for sharing. How was it for you tonight? Very good, Gerrit. You just, Gerrit, you... you I mean, the surgical cure, duck. Huh? Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. No, it was very good, and thank you for for helping me to 
to to yeah to spread the words and to to share uh, all this information on the soft tissue management. It was an honor and pleasure. And uh, to all our audience still watching, we hope to see you at our next EO just live, uh, just ask live, or at one of our future EO events.